If you want to support the channel, then please check out my Patreon page to gain access to exclusive videos, take part in Q&As, and watch my retrospectives before they go live on YouTube. After waiting nearly a year for its release, No Time To Die is finally out in cinemas. It just had its glitzy premiere in the UK at the Royal Albert Hall, and reviews are already spreading across the internet with many fans praising it as a fitting finale to the Daniel Craig James Bond films, with high scores pretty much across the board. So it appears the long wait has been worth it for the fans of the famous 00 agent, though speaking with some of my close friends, they weren't too impressed with it. With it costing over $250 million to make and being advertised what maybe two times due to the changing release dates as a result of the pandemic, Universal Pictures and MGM, which is now owned by Amazon, are going to need a big return to just break even. Now, I'm not going to discuss its plot as I want to avoid any spoilers. I will be exploring the movie in more detail soon with a spoiler discussion, but for this video, I just want to get my thoughts across on what I thought about it and if it lives up to the hype. We all know Spectre didn't live up to the quality of Skyfall, so a lot was riding on this to deliver something really special for Daniel Craig's last outing as 007. I personally haven't followed its production that closely and I've just watched a couple of trailers and had made a conscious effort to avoid any speculation on its story to avoid any surprises before seeing it. So going into it completely fresh, I personally thought No Time to Die was a very good film, but it does have some elements that will leave fans divided. Casino Royale set out to strip back the character and leave behind a lot of the classic tropes of the Bond series. In No Time to Die, they bring it all back for the fans. The gadgets, the villain's layer, two Aston Martins this time, with my favourite, the V8, making an appearance. The film makes a strong connection to Honor Majesty's Secret Service, which hands them a homages with the music as well. And even the opening titles have a nod to Doctor No. You Only Live Twice is also referenced in some way. I'm sure there are some other hidden Easter eggs throughout the film to please the James Bond fanbase. With Kerry Fuganaga in the director's chair, he injects it with a high level of energy and visual flair, and even moments of horror, with some traditional jump scares thrown in for good measure. As Kerry has joined the Eon Productions team, you have a number of regulars behind the camera, such as second unit director Alexander Witt and FX supervisor Chris Corbold, so the action and visual effects are to the usual high standard you come to expect from a James Bond film. The editing is slick, with none of the headache-inducing action that came with Quantum of Solace, and even some of the more recent action films released the past year. You get to see the action and fight scenes play out clearly with no choppy editing. As the Bond franchise has done everything when it comes to action the past 50 years, No Time to Die surprised me by throwing new stuff onto the table which was really exciting to watch. It's also great to see the film is shot on 35mm, and they make use of IMAX cameras, though I don't know which sequences made use of the large format celluloid. When watching something like Tenet, you can clearly tell what's shot in IMAX. It has the longest runtime of all the Bond films, but I didn't feel it ran on for too long. I didn't look at my watch, I was kind of glued to the screen, so I do think the runtime was justified. With it being Craig's last outing, it couldn't be a 100 minute or 120 minute runtime, as it had a lot to tie up, due to the mangled narrative they laid out with the sequels after Casino Royale, with his involvement with Vesper, then introducing Spectre, connecting Bond with Blofeld, and falling in love for the second time with Madeline. Having Bond fall in love again has been an issue with this series. It's great for Bond to have more consequences thrown into his life, and not just for these films to be a simple adventure of Bond receiving a mission, defeating the bad guy and sleeping with a bunch of women along the way. So in their efforts to expand the character and his world, it was totally justified and needed for modern audiences. They wanted to avoid the franchise going stale, but they clearly didn't know where they were going with the sequels, thanks to the jarring shifts in the direction and often clumsy attempts to link all these characters together. But I think No Time to Die does somewhat nicely bookend the story. Rami Malek as Safin is a superb actor and makes for a great villain. He has a strange delivery to his dialogue and comes across as a very creepy character, but he sadly doesn't get enough screen time to really do much. He does get a couple of moments to really chew the dialogue and there is a superb scene between him and Bond. The dialogue in this confrontation is brilliant, but I just wished he was given more time for his character to breathe and be fully developed. The new 00 agent Nomi played by Lashana Lynch, I don't think will get much love from the fans nothing to do with her as an actor, but just with how she is written. From the offset, she is very forgettable. She just ends up being aggressive and just rude with her interactions with James Bond. 
though James doesn't seem phased by what she says and just goes with the punches and just humours her. Once they start working together, there isn't any interesting dialogue between them to get some decent banter. They just have respect for each other by the end. To be honest, I don't think the character was really necessary. But then again, they needed to show the times had moved on since Bond had quit as a double O by the end of Spectre. Paloma, who works for Felix Leiter, was a far better character, well written and funny. It's a shame she only has a minor role. The script has four writers contributing to its screenplay. I think the biggest news was that Phoebe Waller-Bridge was on board to spice up the dialogue. There hasn't been a female writer on the series since the early days with Sean Connery. Phoebe is best known for her comedic writing, and the film does have some good humour thrown in. Nothing laugh out loud funny, but it's well served into the darker direction the film is taking. Humour and Craig's interpretation of the character I don't think go hand in hand though. Because of the serious direction Craig has gone with James Bond since Casino Royale, when he is supposed to be funny, it feels slightly out of place for me, or somewhat forced. Daniel is a very funny guy in interviews, but I don't think he quite has the comedic timing to pull off the humorous moments without it feeling somewhat crowbarred into the script. Roger Moore and Pierce Brosnan could really nail those funny moments effortlessly, and it didn't feel out of place, but with the specific tone of the Craig series, comedy doesn't seem to find its footing. I wasn't surprised to see Hans Zimmer come on board as the composer. He is a safe bet for film studios and one of the most sought after in the industry. He has been attached to many big productions as of late with Dune and Top Gun Maverick. The score is probably the darkest of all the Bond films, very menacing throughout, but Hans also does a solid job of adding strong emotional themes. He makes use of the James Bond theme in the right places and it sounds fantastic. I was pleased with Zimmer's approach to the score, but his style is very familiar though, and by the end he does unfortunately use his usual method of copy and pasting from his previous work into the music. One moment during an action sequence you can clearly hear the music from The Dark Knight, then it morphs into the Bond theme, which was quite jarring. Overall it's a good score, but for Craig's last outing I just wish they brought back David Arnold, who in my opinion is the best person in the film scoring world to handle a James Bond score. The Billie Eilish title song I avoided listening to when it came out and wanted to wait till I saw the film. Billie is a talented singer but the song didn't do much for me. Two thirds of it is slow and dreary and it didn't sound like a Bond song. Then it begins to build up and I was thinking, oh yes, this is getting good. This is sounding like a traditional Bond opening. Then it just abruptly ends. If only it went on for a bit longer. A bit of a letdown for me. I do think it's a solid final outing for Daniel Craig as 007, and for me his best performance as the secret agent. He has a big emotional arc in the story. The film does have some upsetting moments that may leave you a bit teary-eyed by the end, but some may argue it feels a bit forced. Craig as 007 set out to give a new take on the character, and I think he really achieved that. It was a slightly bumpy road along the way down to the series not having a real clear structure on where they wanted to go, so it was to first have a story that unfolds through a series of sequels, and not just be standalone adventures that we were so familiar with for all these years. Definitely try and catch it at the cinema, as James Bond films are intended to be seen on the largest screen possible. It's going to be interesting where they take the series next. It will probably be another four years until we see another film in the long-running franchise. Will they go with an origin-like story again, or go straight into it, with whoever is cast as 007 being sent on a mission to save the world? I personally think the latter. <laughs>